So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. You're all very welcome to the Institute of International and European Affairs uh, for this uh, very special book launch today. Um, I was with uh, Professor Sachs this morning. Uh, Minister Zappone um, organised a very, very interesting workshop on the SDGs through the lens of a child, through the eyes of a child, and uh, it was very, very successful. It was very interactive. Uh, there were keynote speeches by both uh, Jeffrey Sachs and by Minister Zappone. Um, and of course, it covered many, many other issues uh, around climate, around, around foreign policy, US foreign policy. Uh, and I dare say the community here uh, today, who've showed up in such numbers, uh, will have a, a tremendous appetite to hear uh, more. Um, may I just uh, point out to all of you to please put your phones to silent. Um, but you're encouraged to tweet, uh, the hashtag IIEA. Um, as is traditional, the initial address is on the record, and the Q&A session is under Chatham House rule. Now, we will have time for a Q&A. Um, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So let me uh, formally introduce uh, Jeffrey Sachs. He is a professor of economics at Columbia University, thought leader in sustainable development, senior UN advisor, best-selling author, and syndicated columnist. Professor Sachs serves as the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. He's a university professor at Columbia University, the university's highest academic rank. He's also a special advisor to the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, on the Sustainable Development Goals. And I also want to thank uh, Professor Paul Patrick Walsh from UCD uh, for all the work that he has done uh, to help us to bring this event about this afternoon and all the work that he's done with the Sustainable Development Network uh, on behalf of Ireland, uh, contributing to the wonderful collaboration that's such a critical part uh, of the uh, achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals over the next decade or so. So with that, uh, please give a warm welcome to Jeffrey Sachs. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That is a very warm welcome. And I'm really delighted to be here and uh, with many friends and uh, many new friends and looking forward to discussing foreign policy and uh, America and some of our strangeness right now. Uh, but uh, to understand uh, a bit about the peculiar, difficult, challenging international uh, diplomatic environment and foreign policy environment that uh, we face. Uh, I've written this book because I think the United States is not on a safe course, and that has been true for quite a uh, long time. Trump makes uh, this problem uh, much uh, more immediate and uh, much more confused and much graver, but the fact of the matter is uh, American foreign policy has been uh, out of kilter for quite a while, and I think that it has been uh, uh, off course because of a, an overwhelming concept in the American mind, especially it's, it's a broadly shared uh, view, but it is also an elite view of uh, the uh, power uh, structure in the United States, and that is American exceptionalism. So I call this uh, book in subtitle Beyond American Exceptionalism. American exceptionalism is uh, the view that the United States is truly the exceptional country in the world that uh, stands out by dint of its mission, uh, its origins, uh, its values, uh, as uh, having a unique role in the world, and in general, in a world that needs a lot of cooperation uh, and is a diver diverse world, uh, maybe believing uh, that one's country is special is okay, believing that it is exceptional, uh, and uh, therefore uh, with certain prerogatives that no other part of the world has is very dangerous, in my view. And um, we're at a, an especially uh, significant point of danger because the underlying assumptions of 
exceptionalism, which are built on the idea of exceptional capacity to lead, exceptional uh, power, uh, exceptional uh, uh, values, and uh, exceptional preeminence in the world don't apply. And uh, they become more and more contradictory as the uh, rise of China, uh, the rise of other parts of the world uh, make the claims of exceptionalism uh, stranger and uh, more anachronistic than was true uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Even then, it, it was a concept of great hubris and got the United States into uh, a lot of trouble and did not really do a lot of favor for the world, unfortunately. But it becomes uh, more and more disjointed from the realities of the world. That's not how it's viewed in Washington, not just by Trump, but by the security establishment and by, I'd say, the uh, maintained assumptions of the United States, which is that the U.S. must lead. Uh, the U.S. is exceptional. It's the only country that can lead. And while Trump wants to lead in a particular way with uh, basically bashing uh, the other side first before you say good morning, uh, and with a lot of unilateralism and with the great uh, uh, scorn of multilateral ideas, he still wants to lead thinks that America is exceptional. It's not right to think that Trump is, uh, is an isolationist president or uh, is uh, wanting to abandon U.S. leadership. Quite the contrary. Much of what the U.S. is doing at his and his team's uh, prerogatives right now, for example, the trade war with China, is the uh, intention and desire to stay the preeminent, uniquely powerful uh, and dominant country in the world. So that is not an isolationist view. Uh, it just is a particular vision of uh, exceptionalism. So the book uh, traces uh, these ideas back to uh, American roots, uh, which even in the founding of the European settlements in the New World had an exceptionalist element to them. Uh, because uh, as uh, the, uh, especially the English colonies were settled, the concept of the first settlers was this is the new Israel uh, and uh, we're founding a, a new promised land. And that already was a sense of exceptionalism, uh, not of uh, exceptional uh, power in the world, but exceptionalism from uh, the point of view of moral purpose. and. I can tell you as a, somebody who grew up as a child through public schools and uh, as an American uh, uh, citizen and resident all my life, you're imbued with that view uh, basically from the very beginning that there was something unique and special and that America had a uh, unique role and at times it did in a written constitution in uh, creating a, a Republican form of government early on. These are great accomplishments. But from the very beginning, this exceptionalism uh, was uh, a founding myth, of course, as well as uh, having elements of reality. The grim reality of America was uh, that from almost the beginning of the settlements uh, in the early 17th century, the settlers and then eventually the United States itself was at war almost nonstop. Uh, and in this we take after uh, the founding uh, power, uh, uh, Britain, which was at war almost nonstop for centuries, including uh, with this country. Um, but the United States uh, was born in war and uh, grew up in war, and that really is part of the exceptionalism. Uh, it's not part of the self 
gratifying story of our myths, but it's part of a more grim reality. So American exceptionalism was born in the unusual circumstances of colonizing not a new world, but a world uh, filled with uh, populations across the American continent with Native Americans who had first to be pushed aside systematically over a period of three centuries. And uh, so there was a lot of genocide. Uh, and there was slavery. Uh, and so from the very beginning, not quite the very beginning, but by the end of the 17th century, uh, there were two fronts of war underway, uh, or two fronts of violence. Uh, one was the violence of a growing slave population in the Caribbean and then in uh, um, the southern part of uh, the North American continent. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, wars against uh, the Native American populations. And even during this period, though, uh, there was a, an extraordinary hubris of this new country when the United States won its independence from uh, England with the support of France, uh, uh, because just a few decades later, uh, the United States told Europe, don't meddle in all of the Americas. That's our backyard to meddle in. Uh, which was a rather uh, hubristic idea, the Monroe Doctrine. But early on, even before the U.S. could project much power, uh, it was uh, already with a, a vision of uh, a larger gaze in the world. The 19th century in the United States was the century of first following England's industrialization and then surpassing England in economic might. And, uh, but domestically, the United States had the uh, business of a civil war to uh, settle the question of slavery. Uh, and then it had the Indian wars throughout the 19th century to settle the question of the Native American populations. And uh, those were quite brutal wars. Of course, the Civil War was the most brutal that the Americans, uh, United States ever fought on its, and uh, the wars against the Native American populations were a continuing series of genocides. And the president uh, that uh, Trump most admires, Andrew Jackson, was a genocidal, homicidal president probably with the, the uh, most perverse personality of any president we've ever had until Trump arrived. Uh, and uh, probably, from all I can gather, a rival of Trump and antisocial personality disorder, um, but a really nasty man uh, who pushed the native populations to the west of the Mississippi River. Well, by the end of the 19th century, the, those wars were over. And uh, America looked around, the leadership looked around, and uh, our role model, uh, Britain, had made a worldwide empire. And uh, France and had its uh, empire, uh, and uh, even Spain kept some of its empire a little bit. Uh, Portugal kept a little bit of its empire. Italy was a wannabe imperial power, so it would uh, try, uh, try and again to uh, invade Ethiopia. And the United States decided it wanted its empire also, and so it needed a good war in 1898. Um, and uh, when a battleship uh, ex boiler exploded in Havana Harbor in 1898, decided uh, that that was a good time to invade uh, Havana uh, and uh, have a war with Spain and gain its first overseas colonies. Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines, two of which we've given up. One uh, is uh, bankrupt uh, and uh, still reeling from a massive hurricane last year uh, and still in America's colonial hands. And I think it's right to say that um, this building of the overseas empire starting in 1898 became the business of the 20th century. 
of U.S. foreign policy. For the first 30 years, it was repeated invasions of Central America and the Caribbean uh, because we sent in the Marines every couple of years to collect debts from countries or to uh, run countries or to grab a piece of Colombia to make it Panama uh, to build a canal uh, that would be under uh, U.S. ownership. And through the 1930s, America got its, uh, uh, its experience in overseas projection of power. And then uh, World War II, of course, was the decisive, uh, most horrific uh, war in human history, uh, and uh, the one that finally, in effect, ended the British Empire uh, and uh, passed the baton to the US Empire at the end of uh, World War II. And modern American foreign policy picks up at that point. And there really were two visions of American foreign policy still built on an even more exceptionalist cell vision at this point because now the US was the most powerful country in the world, the technologically most advanced country by far, the only major power in the world that had fought World War II with only one day of battle on its own soil, the attack on Pearl Harbor. But other than that, uh, a country that was not only intact but was had a, a, a war that uh, led to the most remarkable industrialization and technological advancement imaginable. And at the end of World War II, also with the uh, development of the atomic bomb, the United States completely reigned supreme in the world as, I would say then, applicable phrase, an exceptional country. It was the only country of power at that time uh, that had all of these attributes of economic might, massive technological advancement, unique military capacity, and uh, an economic reach that uh, was already uh, worldwide in influence. And with Britain uh, in uh, crisis, deep debt, uh, at the end of uh, World War II, um, the United States saw its uh, global leadership uh, come to fruition with two interrelated viewpoints. One was Roosevelt's vision. Roosevelt I regard as America's greatest president by far, I would say, in, in, its, in a way. Um, but he had the vision of the United Nations and the idea of a collective security to build a world of peace based on a charter, based on principles, international law, and an international institution that would keep the peace being the UN Security Council. Uh, a second vision was not a collective security, but a US-led security. And especially since the Cold War began to unfold immediately at the end of uh, World War II, and that's a very complex and uh, much contested history but I would say it's, it was a Cold War that was not an inevitable battle of a ruthlessly expansionist Soviet Union, but was a, a detour of history that was extraordinarily dangerous, costly, and didn't have to happen, actually, uh, is my own understanding of the Cold War. But that side of the story gave a different meaning of exceptionalism, which was that America was the unique protector of the world, the free world, and it was the only one that could defend against a, uh, an expansionist, ruthless, totalitarian power, uh, and uh, the UN would not really suffice for that. The US would have to stand on its own feet, it would have to lead, and it was only going to be through the hard-headed, tough, militarized leadership of the United States that the world would get through a twilight struggle between communism and capitalism. That's 
how I grew up believing that story. I think it's basically wrong, uh, but uh, that is uh, certainly the story that I imbibed uh, from grade school onward. And there was therefore a tension, which is inevitable, on the one side, an international order, rule of law, universal declaration of rights, treaties, the GATT for trade, uh, the World Health Organization, and other new organs of the United Nations, a Security Council. Then there was the Cold War. And then there was the final real bleak side, I would say, of exceptionalism, which is we're so damn powerful, we also should take actions that are just in our interest, period. And uh, in 1947, the U.S. took a fateful step for our politics in the National Security Act, which created the CIA. And the CIA was chartered at the first moment as having a dual role, an intelligence agency and a secret army. And that was very worrisome. Uh, and Atchison and Truman knew that this was probably fairly dangerous for democratic institutions to combine those two functions. But in effect, the U.S. created a, a secret army of uh, spooks and, uh, and, and uh, people who could blow up things or put bullets in people's heads or create unrest or instigate general strikes not a large army, but a, 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 a private army that could do dastardly things with the deniability of the President of the United States. And one famous uh, example of that, two of the most famous examples uh, of what goes wrong with that was in 1953 when uh, Britain and the U.S. decided to overthrow the uh, government of Iran, uh, which had the temerity to believe that the oil that just happened to be under Iranian land actually belonged to the Iranians. We don't know still how they got that idea, uh, but uh, it actually belonged to the uh, British first and uh, later to the Americans, but the Iranians uh, through some confusion, uh, believed that it was theirs, and so it was very important to uh, dismiss the government and put in uh, the Shah of Iran, who understood better who owned the oil. Uh, and then the next year, uh, a uh, uh, really uh, odd uh, character uh, in uh, Guatemala got the idea that land uh, might be redistributed for landless peasants. Now, this is another completely insane idea, obviously, especially if the land was somewhere near the land where pineapples were being grown by United Fruit. And um, it happened that United Fruit's uh, lawyer uh, was uh, Cromwell and, uh, Sullivan and Cromwell. Uh, a major uh, U.S. law firm whose senior partner, um, John Foster Dulles, happened to be the Secretary of State. So when Jacobo Arbenz got the idea that there would be a mild land redistribution, United Fruit called the uh, Secretary of State, who happened to have a brother, Alan Dulles, who was the CIA director. Uh, and. Uh, uh, John Foster called Allen, and Arbenz was gone uh, soon afterwards. So that was not the Cold War, that was not the UN, that was uh, private business dealings uh, that also are part of exceptionalism. And American foreign policy in the post-war period varied across these different uh, conceptions uh, with a lot of uh, profound mistakes and a lot of projection of military power that became, of course, uh, an, an end in itself, I would say, uh, and almost an unstoppable 
mechanism. Uh, the U.S. Uh, put military bases uh, around the world, unlike any other country in history other than, the, than Britain, uh, which was the role model, but the U.S. far surpassed uh, its predecessor in this. And the current count of military bases around the world, though some are very small, is uh, typically held to be about 800 military bases overseas in 70 countries. So the map is just a map of U.S military extension. And the general rule is wherever you put a base, never leave. That's another principle. Uh, if you do play the board game Risk, it's a lot like that board game, uh, which is you want a piece on every uh, square of the board. And if you don't have a piece on that square of the board, uh, it means somebody else does, and they can start to move closer to your spot on the board. And so it's really a, a zero-sum struggle that has no end until you cover the entire board. And that, I think, is one of the uh, motivating factors uh, in the mindset of, uh, of the United States. Well, in the U.S. vision, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed in the 1980s. This was taken to be entirely the fruits of uh, the Cold War and especially at that point Ronald Reagan's leadership um, rather than what George Kennan had told American policymakers 40 years earlier, which was that the Soviet system was so flawed it would eventually collapse on its own, thank you. Uh, and uh, Kennan said, we don't have to have a twilight struggle for the survival of the world. The Soviet Union is not after global takeover. Uh, it is after its security zone in Eastern Europe and, uh, and uh, uh, Western Asia uh, because it's been invaded so many times and we should be finding a solution uh, that meets uh, also the security uh, perceptions of uh, Russia in particular, but that as to communism, communism was a profoundly flawed design and it would take care of itself uh, in essence. Uh, it would not be defeated, it would defeat itself. I was, uh, became economic advisor to a number of governments in Eastern Europe at the end of the 1980s, so I witnessed firsthand the uh, transformation that was then underway, and it was a wonderful political uh, freeing uh, of uh, countries from uh, Soviet imperial rule, and I was all for it. But I was also very much struck uh, and uh, very much admiring of Mikhail Gorbachev uh, as he deftly unwound his country's empire and had the notion, which he deeply held, that we should find a way to peaceful, uh, open uh, relations and that there should be a common, peaceful home between uh, Amsterdam or Rotterdam and Vladivostok as he described it on the Eurasian landmass and that we could do away with the Cold War, which was a terrible idea, and do away with uh, Soviet uh, control in Eastern Europe. And I can tell you, you know this, but I watched it also firsthand. He, Gorbachev was the architect of the democratic transition in Eastern Europe to an important extent. He told his comrades, you have to leave now. He told Solidarity, it's time for you to join the government. Uh, this would be a good thing. Uh, he helped to bring that about peacefully. I mention all of this because at the end of the Cold War, the US exceptionalism was at its most heightened uh, extent. And the idea was that there was now a world with one superpower alone and that it was the greatest military and economic colossus in the history of the world, and that the U.S. was proven now to be the exceptional country that would guide the world. 
it was a triumphalist view. Uh, it's not that the U.S. was completely irresponsible in how it proceeded, but it did proceed with incredible hubris after 1989. We won, they lost, we get to pick up the pieces. And again, with different strains of belief, the shared vision, whether it was Madeleine Albright calling the United States the indispensable country, or the neocons in uh, Washington who took a more militarized vision of this, the idea was we're here and we run the show. And uh, Francis Fukuyama put it as the end of history, uh, in essence, uh, though he didn't mean US hegemonic control, but in effect, it was the US model uh, writ large and one superpower in the world. The US took the opportunity to do two major things. One, start moving NATO towards the east. Uh, and uh, rather than saying NATO was the instrument to uh, defend against a Soviet invasion of Western Europe, uh, NATO was reinvented to be a US-led military alliance that would now incorporate the countries that had left the Soviet, uh, left the Soviet Union. This was really, a, this decision was made easily and it was a bad and wrong and provocative decision because it kept a Cold War but just kept moving the borders until the Cold War was with Russia uh, as uh, the last step of this. And the second thing we know from accounts of uh, Wesley Clark, who was the NATO commander uh, under Clinton, uh, that the bravado and the triumphalism at the end of the Cold War led the American policy planners of the neoconservative persuasion to believe that their next task was to throw out the regimes that were the Soviet or Russian allied regimes in the Middle East. It was now time to clean up the remaining mess of the Cold War because as uh, Wolfowitz explained to Wesley Clark in 1991, what we learned from the first Gulf War was we could act and Russia would do nothing. So we have a free playing field now and now it's time to clean up the Middle East. Cleaning up the Middle East meant getting rid of Saddam Hussein, it meant uh, getting rid of Bashar al-Assad, uh, it eventually uh, meant uh, getting rid of Muammar Gaddafi, who was viewed as a nut, maybe useful for financing Sarkozy's presidential election at some point, but afterwards more dispensable uh, than not, and so on. And one interpretation, which I believe, is that the U.S engaged in Middle East wars from that point onward to fulfill the neoconservative vision of the sole superpower cleaning up the tableau. And I take a view which is a very, um, very much a minority view, but I let the majority be wrong all the time. <laughs> so I'm not shy about uh, letting uh, the conventional view be wrong. Uh, I take the view that uh, the Syrian war, for example, was a U.S. war of choice to overthrow Assad in the context of the Arab Spring in 2011, but just went terribly wrong. It was always a bad idea, but it went terribly wrong in the sense that Assad just had the bad taste to stay in power uh, and to call on his friends, the Russians and the Iranians, to defend his hold on power. And it turned out that U.S. logistics and Saudi funding and jihadists were not enough to throw Assad from power, especially after the Russians intervened. Of course, the view that we hear in the United States is something completely different, which was that there was a democratic uprising in Syria which was violently uh, repressed and that Obama was uh, too uh, timid uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, and uh, conflicted to move, so the U.S. did nothing, and then the Soviets came in, the Russians came in, uh, and uh, militarized the conflict even more and made a mess of it. In other words, taking the agency outside of the U.S. I just have a piece of evidence that contradicts that view, and that is that President Obama signed an order for the CIA to cooperate with Saudi Arabia to overthrow the uh, Syrian government. Uh, and that is how U.S. foreign policy operates, and it failed, like almost everything the CIA does, by the way, uh, other than intelligence collection, which it does pretty well. But when it comes to these operational destabilization efforts, it almost always leads to a debacle because you cannot run the world through uh, this kind of uh, machinations and expect things to work out properly. So my take is that we're still stuck in this view. What does Mr. Trump mean for this? <coughs> Two things. One, at the individual level, he is uh, mentally unstable and a dangerous uh, person, uh, and do not <coughs> underestimate that fact. This is not a normal, healthy human being. This is uh, absolutely uh, uh, impaired individual, the likes of which we've never had as President of the United States. He's also a nasty man and a racist and many other things, but more than that, he is narcissistic, sadistic, uh, impulsive. He's really a disordered mind. Uh, and I don't know if Ian Hughes is here. No. Oh, there. So uh, your book on disordered minds is a brilliant book. Uh, and um, I thought before I just steal the phrase, uh, I should uh, make sure uh, you're here because uh, Ian has written a wonderful book about what happens when people like Trump become president, and it's extremely dangerous. Uh, and we are in a big danger. But at a political level, what Trump represents is a kind of extreme version of exceptionalism. Trump does not understand cooperation and never has in his life. So this is part of the mental instability. He believes in the deal. The deal is screw the other side as much as you can, take as much money you, as you can for your family, put it away. If you end up defaulting to your creditors, uh, all the more power to you. Life is a real estate deal in New York with shady personalities uh, and hot money. That's life. Uh, so that's uh, the uh, one, one side of uh, this. But what it means in foreign policy terms is not a retreat from American exceptionalism, but a retreat from the idea that the rule of law, cooperation, principles, institutions, organizations, the UN, the UN Security Council, uh, or any of the other uh, structures that the United States built up in the Rooseveltian version of US leadership should have any role to play. So it's a complete disdain for structure. It's a complete disdain for rules. Uh, it's a complete disdain for process, for negotiation itself, other than the negotiation of the deal. Uh, and um, this is a big problem. Uh, what it means in terms of the vision of the world is that the notion that America should be the preeminent power everywhere is amplified in this view, not diminished. The notion in our security doctrine and in our defense doctrine that America should be able to fight two major theater wars and prevail remains the case, that America should have dominant military power in every region of the world prevails. Uh, and the new twist is that China is, together with Russia, 
described as strategic competitors out to undermine values in the world that are central to America's well-being and security. So now these are not counterpart countries or countries uh, that we must trade and deal with, but countries that are subversive of fundamental American objectives. I think what China is subversive of is something quite different, and that is American uh, economic preeminence because China is a big country and a very, uh, a very uh, um, hardworking and uh, successful country, still much poorer than Ireland and the United States, but with a scale of reach and a technological capacity and a rate of improvement that means that China becomes economically uh, of a weight that is comparable in international trade to the United States and technologically uh, at a level that makes Northeast Asia, China, Korea, Japan together, uh, the counterparts of Europe and the United States in technological capacity. And this also translates into military power as well. In other words, China is an affront to US predominance. Uh, the United States be remains a very powerful, very rich country, but not the sole exceptional country that can determine all of the rules. So in that vein, that's why we have a trade war with China, in my view. Uh, we have a trade war because the effrontery of China is to uh, accelerate its technological development. And the goal of the trade war is not to redress a trade imbalance uh, or to get China to obey and abide by certain WHO, uh, WTO rules, but rather to stop China's uh, technological ascent. And that's why the United States is asking all of its allied countries, like this one and Britain and Australia and others, don't buy Huawei and don't buy uh, and don't sell uh, technologically advanced countries. We're in a cold war with China, and we need to use our old playbook to stop the trade in dual-use technologies. We need to make sure that China's growth. Uh, it slows considerably. We need to close our markets to China's continued expansion. And that is the Trumpian idea. And at the same time, uh, for other pesky powers, uh, regional powers like Iran, uh, we'll work with our local allies like the Saudis uh, and Israel and so forth, and undermine those regimes, destabilize them, overthrow them if we can, uh, and possibly something uh, worse than that. So that's the current version of American exceptionalism. Now let me just end by saying it's all a little bit crazy in a world when we have other things to do, like stopping uh, human-induced climate change, stopping environmental <clears throat> disasters which are running away with us, address underlying uh, problems in the world economy that are also conducive to unwanted mass migration uh, and other forms of destabilization. In other words, what we should have is a positive foreign policy agenda of solving global problems. And in the UN context, that has been well defined, actually, as the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. That's the constructive, positive agenda. You will never hear Donald Trump use the phrase sustainable development goals. <laughs> and the only, I even took a tactical decision, 
don't use the phrase in Washington because he might hear about them uh, and uh, then try to stop them as something nefarious. Uh, and the only context you'll hear about the Paris Climate Agreement is why we should leave it. So the U.S. has no constructive foreign policy agenda other than the maintenance of its power dominance. That is the foreign policy. It's an impossible foreign policy to achieve. It is one that could lead to disaster because if you define your foreign policy as dominance, uh, you are inviting war. And that becomes the logical conclusion of this kind of approach to the world. But that's literally, I'm not even speaking figuratively, that's literally how the US strategic uh, doctrines are now defined as the call for dominance. And by the way, I'll just emphasize in this vein of exceptionalism, it's not just Trump, although he is our unstable, uh, dangerous uh, carrier of this right now. I have a colleague uh, who's an esteemed US diplomat, or he was a colleague of mine, Ambassador Robert Blackwell, who was a, taught at the Kennedy School with me at Harvard and then became ambassador to uh, India for example, and he wrote an essay three years ago that, well, China now is a threat to the United States. We must contain China uh, because uh, otherwise uh, U.S. Uh, preeminence and ability to imbue the world with U.S. values will be gravely threatened. So this is a mainstream view uh, among a certain part of the American establishment. It, it's not just an outlandish view. It's a deeply uh, embedded idea. We need something now completely different. And just a final word about what I think that completely different approach is. The scale of our problems comes at different levels depending on which problems and which aspects of problems we're talking about. But climate change is a global problem that can only be solved globally, for example. A lot of other environmental crises, certainly the oceans, certainly uh, a lot of the deforestation, which is secondary to global trade and agricultural products, are also global scale problems that need a global approach. Other problems like how Ireland and Europe will move to renewable energy are regional scale. They can't be solved by an individual country alone. They require a regional scale approach because you have to bring solar from Greece into Germany or you have to do something that crosses uh, national boundaries. So the EU becomes the natural level of problem solving for a lot of infrastructure, for example. Other problems are truly national scale. Still other problems are local scale. So the doctrine of subsidiarity uh, is the right vision of this. But my view is that a huge uh, preponderance of major problems has a uh, regional scale uh, set of commitments. So the European Union is vital for Europe's prosperity. Brexit and all of that is a horrendous throwback to weird ideas uh, that make absolutely no sense. Um, the African Union is essential for Africa's development. And in general, if you take that view, which I would argue is economically and biologically and from an ecosystem point of view, a necessary view, then regional cooperation becomes essential. But a divide et impera, divide and conquer, methodology of the British Empire or the American Empire is very invidious to that. So the idea that we side with the Saudis against the Iranians is a complete throwback to stupid ideas rather than to the problem solving of a desertifying region 
that needs to make an energy transformation and an ecological transformation with urgency, and therefore Saudi-Iranian uh, cooperation is preeminent, not creating the divisions. So my view, and I'll stop here, is we have global problems to solve that will require strong regional cooperation in regions where there are Cold War or other legacy divisions, Northeast Asia with China, Japan, Korea, Southern Asia with Pakistan and India, the Middle East with Turkey, the Arab region, uh, and uh, the Iranians. Overcoming those historical legacies is the core work of sustainable development diplomacy. And to make sustainable development work, to stop human-made climate change, for example, on the time horizon we have, we need the EU to be working with NAFTA, the AU, Northeast Asia, SARC, which doesn't exist in this context, but that's the Southern Asian cooperation organization which should work. In other words, regional cooperation to knit together quickly a transformation to low carbon energy. This can't be done 193 individual signatories, and it certainly can't be done with the one Nudnik, a president of the United States, saying we're not part of this. And so we need to actually have a diplomatic structure with strong regional institutions and global cooperation through the United Nations. Well, there are a lot of specific pieces to that, uh, and I'll just end with two. One is Europe has to work. Uh, in other words, uh, Europe has to resist now the deliberate, probably Trump-Putin alliance to undermine uh, a strong European Union. We don't really know what that is. Maybe Mr. Mueller will tell us more about that. But at least Europe is being besieged from both sides, from Putin's machinations on one side and from Trump's machinations on the other side. We don't know whether that's one thing or two things. I think it's arguably one thing. Maybe Mr. Bannon is really the, the, the uh, courier for this. I don't know. But in any event, Europe needs to resist this. And my view is that for Europe to resist this, it needs to strengthen the union and it needs to raise the budget of the union. It needs to have more resources to be able to invest and spend more at a union level. You know, the EU budget is only 1% of European Union GDP. You cannot run a political union on such a small budget. And that's the fundamental challenge that Europe is facing right now, even though it's framed in many different ways. So that, I think, is one piece. The other piece is to strengthen the United Nations. Uh, and uh, this is a, a long story, and we're with one political party in the United States, the Republican Party, that probably wouldn't mind if the US left the UN. Uh, <coughs> we have a, just, it's been vulgar UN bashing by our outgoing ambassador, Nikki Haley, who wags her finger and says, we spend money and you don't vote with the United States. We're never, we're taking names, she says. This is called diplomacy, America style. Uh, and uh, it doesn't exactly win the hearts and minds, nor does it win the votes. And it doesn't uh, work for the world. So invigorating the United Nations is the second great task, I believe, because we cannot address critical global scale problems except with the strong and effective United Nations. Thank you very much.